AE, which is it opened up to everyone? Yes, it is. Good. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is uh, our May 1st, first Monday of the month, uh, EMX Symposium, which will be the last of the current academic year. Uh, springtime in the Northern Hemisphere, and we're beginning to enjoy uh, regular weather again, if, uh, if uh, it is indeed regular weather. Um, we'll look forward to seeing people in these summer uh, meetings. Uh, uh, M&M uh, coming up in, in uh, late July and uh, the IMC in Busan in September. We start again for the, at the next academic year in October. Anyway, we have uh, pretty exciting uh, speakers uh, today and who are going to be able to talk to both constituencies. And so uh, this should be of interest uh, to, to both uh, audiences, the bio and the physical sciences people. I will uh, just then uh, want to thank uh, Yi and his uh, colleagues for uh, helping to run the, the show for us. Uh, they've been doing a great job. Uh, and of course, our colleagues, uh, Jen Dion and uh, Professor Yi Che. But I'm very happy to hand over to our friend Wa Chu, uh, who will introduce uh, the first speaker. Wa, please. Good morning. Uh, it's my great uh, pleasure to introduce uh, our colleagues, uh, Christopher Barnes, to be our speaker this morning. And Christopher got uh, his initial training at University of North Carolina, and then he got his PhD in Pittsburgh, and subsequently uh, he joined uh, the, the lab at uh, Caltech, uh, where he got trained uh, in structural biologies. Uh, and it's our great uh, fortune to have uh, Christopher Bang to join our faculty uh, a couple of years ago in the Department of Biology. And uh, he is also a Serafan ChemH Institute scholar. And his interest is to use uh, structural techniques to understand the basic principles of uh, virus and host interactions in order to develop uh, potent therapeutics. And so during the pandemic, uh, Christopher has been very, very active during this very difficult time to uh, join to our faculty and become uh, productive immediately. So uh, it's our great uh, interest to listen to his progress, how he used his skill uh, to develop the next generations of therapeutics uh, against any uh, foreign pathogens. And uh, Christopher, welcome, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much, Wai. It's a pleasure to be with everyone this morning. Um, yeah, I want to talk about a little bit about the research we've been doing here at, at uh, Stanford in my group. Uh, plays a part. Yeah, so yeah, I'm Christopher Barnes, and I just started my group here at Stanford uh, in let's see, July of 2021, so not quite two years yet, um, but it's been a pleasure to be here at Stanford and engage with me and my colleagues here around campus and uh, really expand the research we're doing using cryonium really to drive new immunotherapies against emerging coronaviruses as well as other viruses, including HIV and flavin viruses. Uh, but today I'll talk about our work in, in the coronavirus space. And so just to kind of you know, take a step back, you know, me as a biologist, I've been trained really in many different techniques uh, but when I think about biology, I always think about how do we see biology. And so, of course, there's many different ways we can visualize, you know, biological actions happening around us in, in the real world. Of course, our own eye are, is able to see things as small as ants. We can use you know, light microscopy, uh, fluorescence microscopy to begin to see cells and neurons and ultra, you know, structures like um, within these cells. But, you know, for me, my training as a chemist uh, made me want to think about seeing biology and seeing the interactions, right? So seeing the atoms that are uh, engaging with one another and how that actually drives biological function of these macromolecules. And so to do that, you know, I've trained in all three of the kind of high resolution structural techniques, beginning with NMR during my undergraduate master's degree at the University of North Carolina, uh, X-ray crystallography during my PhD, where we expanded into the x the X-ray pre-electron laser, uh, you know, crystallography, 
as well as doing micro ED uh, to some degree with uh, Tamir Golan. Uh, but then, you know, as I transitioned to my postdoc, I began to learn CAR EM as that, you know, resolution revolution began to occur. And, you know, what's great about now CAR EM, as we all know, is that, you know, we are able now to visualize almost atomic uh, resolution structures, as illustrated here in this April Ferritin reconstruction, uh, showing individual densities for, you know, some of the atoms within the backbone of this protein. All right, so this high-resolution structural techniques allows us to actually visualize these volatile micromolecules. So how can we then utilize that information uh, to advance human health? And so that's kind of like the underlying question of my lab and my research is like, how can we leverage the structural information, combine it with engin protein engineering, and then utilize other techniques in immunology, biochemistry to really advance and promote human health? So in essence, we work with clinicians. Uh, we establish patient cohorts, whether these be convalescent individuals or people that are chronically infected, like in the case of HIV. We look for those individuals that have, you know, really outstanding, you know, activity from SERA. And then we question what's happening with these individuals, right? So we assess their hemoimmune response. And so in this, you know, instance here, we're looking at the B cell response of so those cells that give rise to antibodies. We're trying to isolate those antibodies in order to understand those really potent antibodies as those shown here in these different colors and how they could potentially engage uh, with the viral pathogen. We then use structural techniques, X-ray crystallography, but mostly cryo-EM the last couple of years to begin to assess and understand, characterize these antibodies, how they bind their epitopes or their regions on the viral glycoproteins and you know, inhibit the virus from actually entering those cells. From that information, we can then use that to further develop these antibodies to become more potent using direct evolution and surface display techniques. Or in the case of, say, HIV, we can understand the epitopes that are being targeted and then try to mimic those epitopes by doing immune gene design and protein engineering so that we can then make a vaccine that can lead to the responses that we care about uh, and need for viral clearance. We then take our you know, products into animals and begin to make sure that they're effective in vivo. And of course, along this pathway, there's a lot of places where we can go back and use some feedback in order to enhance or optimize our constructs, antibodies, or immunogens further to help get us the desired result, which is effective in preventing the you know, immunotherapy or vaccine. So, you know, a good way to illustrate how you know, structural biology has really helped us during the pandemic is looking at, you know, SARS-CoV-2. Right. And so before we even get into what the work we did, we can begin to think about and appreciate that right, it was structural biology that allowed us to understand and engineer the spike like a protein to have those stabilizing 2P mutations, uh, which then, of course, were the you know, formula that went into the mRNA vaccines for which we all you know, you know, took and, and received and allowed us to actually get out of this pandemic. All right. So structural biology has been really at the beginning important for us in, in developing immunotherapies you know, and vaccines especially against SARS-CoV-2. So, you know, during my postdoc, um, Pamela Bjorkman, whose lab I was in at Caltech, you know, raised, you know, access in group meeting who wants to volunteer to, you know, work on this project. I was like, sure, you know, I'll, I'll volunteer. I'll work on, you know, a couple of SARS-CoV-2 projects because I haven't, you know, I have been doing a lot of HIV work. So I thought it would be a fun little uh, soiree into a different field. Uh, needless to say, it was a very long <laughs> and tiring road for the last three years. Uh, because we know from this virus, right, the spike like a protein, uh, you know, this is the causative agent uh, of infection. And so antibodies targeting the spike protein, uh, you know, are kind of where we want to look at. And so our work over the last three years has really been trying to understand how these antibodies bind. Uh, and so we're utilizing low resolution techniques, uh, high resolution cryo techniques, as well as X-ray crystallography to solve well over 50 structures within the last three years. To help us understand many different aspects of viral entry and how antibodies can prevent viral infection. And so just to kind of highlight some of the work we did, uh, first being, you know, uh, adapting uh, techniques from Andrew Ward's group using negative stain, um, you know, EM to epitope map polyclonal responses from individuals at the beginning of the pandemic and begin to understand that the high correlates of utilizing activity. So again, these are convalescent donors looking at their serum dilution titers that can neutralize. So the higher the tire, the more potent the response. We begin to understand that the you know, dominant epitopes being recognized uh, by antibody responses were those towards the receptor bind domain or the RBD shown here in red, as well as dominant responses to other domains, including the internal domain, which I'll speak about a little bit further in my talk. 
We then worked with Michelle Lucian's wax lab to isolate monoclonal antibodies, and for which we then classified these monoclonal antibodies into four distinct classes uh, based off their characteristic properties, whether or not they could, you know, in the, uh, inhibit ACE2 binding as those in class one and two. If they set outside and target more conserved regions like in class three and class four, and what that means for actually making antibody cocktails for the immunotherapy, uh, which we were able to illustrate and utilize and move a few antibodies into the clinic uh, during the pandemic. We also began to look at you know, how antibodies that were very, very potent, uh, what made those antibodies more potent than, say, you know, clonal relatives. And so we began to show that you know, bridging interactions, quaternary interactions between antibodies in the domains within the uh, spike trimer were really important to lead to potency, including mechanisms that lock uh, the spike RBDs into a close conformation, as well as the understanding how antibodies can potentially bind and have intramolecular ability, or basically be able to bind with both arms of that IgG antibody and basically attach and have higher affinity, uh, local affinity on the spike trimer. And this actually became very important uh, for antibodies as we move them into in vivo models. And the antibodies that combine with avidity typically behaves and, uh, and were more effective at uh, preventing infection or treating infection. Uh, as the mRNA vaccines began to roll out, we began to randomly sample individuals and look at the antibodies that were being enlisted by the spike trimers that were present now in our cells uh, and show that these antibodies were structurally and functionally similar to those found in convalescent donors. Uh, we utilized structures uh, from ACE2 bound ACE, uh, spike trimers or RBDs to help design you know, the novel molecules with the, in collaboration with the company Neolucan uh, in outside of the University of Washington, uh, and show that you know, computational modeling of these novel mini binders or uh, ACE2 mimics, experimentally we determine these structures and show they were quite similar. And these, of course, uh, then went into the clinic as well and showed the ability to protect. Uh, we began to understand viral escape and how antibodies were able to thwart these viral escape mechanisms uh, and show that you know, there are properties in certain uh, classes of antibodies that are really good at you know, dodging these variants of concerns as they were popping up. And finally, we began to look at cross-reactive antibodies, uh, like the one shown here, C118, which showed that you know, antibodies raised from the SARS-CoV-2 infection uh, could you know, bind multiple SARS-CoV-2 uh, lineage or coronaviruses that were emerging, and showed that if we were actually to adapt this and take RBDs from these different strains and put them into mosaic particles, that these could actually elicit very cross-reactive antibodies they would be protective against emerging coronavirus threats. So that was my postdoc. Uh, you know, a lot of work went into a lot of the things we did, excuse me, um, showing all the specificities of antibody responses, how monoclonal antibodies really target RBDs, as well as just understanding you know, the antibody combined to the RBD landscape. So as I started my group here at Stanford, you know, I had kind of two nagging questions, you know, in my head that related to this coronavirus, um, you know, spike trimer. One being, were there other epitopes outside the RBD that could serve as potent neutralizing uh, or targets of potent neutralizing antibodies? As well as, you know, could we actually identify other epitopes that were more conserved across the entire family of coronaviruses? And so some of this work for the initial question was spurred by that low resolution negative stain EM map, which showed that this antibody shown here in green was targeting the internal domain, right? So could there be other antibodies doing that? So the field had already kind of answered that question and said that, you know, for the most part, while the NTD is an antigenic site and you get multiple responses, and this is work done by David Wiesler and many others, um, but really the predominant site for antibodies that could neutralize, which is again, protect or prevent viral infection, in an in vitro setting, uh, where antibodies that target this one site here called the site one or antigenic supersite. And because this one site was the predominant site for neutralizing antibodies, uh, it was easily escaped among variants of concern that were arising. So many people began to ignore NTD antibodies. But when Omicron hit, and we saw that you know, Omicron had 15 mutations in the RBD uh, that for the most part overlapped with regions of known potent neutralizing antibodies, Yet, when we boosted people with mRNA vaccine that saw high neutralizing titers, this you know, made us speculate that whether or not you know, other epitopes were contributing to these increased titers. 
we now know that you know people when boosted with mRNA vaccines actually create higher you know titers of even RBD antibodies that could actually respond and bind to Omicron variants. Uh, but at the time, we thought that other epitopes were also in part of this mix and being recalled. Uh, so in this work shown here, uh, we in collaboration with Michelle Newsom's Wax Lab at Rockefeller University, we isolated many different NTV antibodies and began to characterize them in asking three specific questions. One, do these NTD antibodies evolve and gain more mutations like those of their RBD counterparts? Are there other neutralizing epitopes outside the antigenic supersite that could be the target of NTD antibody responses? As well as, can NTD antibodies cross-react among all the different variants of concern and be utilized in emerging immunotherapies uh, to ward off uh, you know, continued antigenic drift within the spike tree? So, Working with Michelle's group, uh, we isolated you know, over 500 different monoclonal, or I should say cloned over 500 different monoclonal antibodies and first tested binding. And so what I'm showing you here are antibodies isolated either one month or 12 months. And what you can see is that you know, those looked at 12 months or show higher affinities to the different uh, NTD baits or proteins from the different variants of concern. And those clones or these antibodies that persisted over the lifetime of that individual also show higher uh, affinities. So this suggested that the NTD antibodies were indeed evolving and gaining some mutation to have higher affinities, but this didn't uh, correlate with increased neutralizing titers, right? So in essence, antibodies that were isolated one month convalescence uh, showed similar neutralizing profiles as those isolated later on uh, throughout the course of um, the individual. So that was you know, disappointing because in the case of RBD antibodies, we typically saw increased potency the further you went out from convalescence or mRNA vaccination. But needless to say, we had some potent neutralizing antibodies. And so we began to map these antibodies using a BLI competition assay. So what I'm showing you here is a heat map of this competition assay in which we have an antibody bound to the biosensor. We come in with the NTD monomeric bait, and then we ask whether or not the second antibody can bind. So comp competing antibodies show up as blue, non-competing show up as red. So what I hope you can appreciate is that we have you know, six distinct sites or classes of antibodies. And then if you look at the neutralizing profile shown here on the right y-axis, you can see again, neutralizing equals blue, non-neutralizing is red, where you have you know, neutralizing activity, mainly against the wild type of gamma strains, but not Omicron for sites one and two. Uh, site three doesn't really neutralize much, but then when you get down to sites four, five, and six, we begin to see a broad utilizing activity of these antibodies, right? So this suggested to us that we were having antibodies that were targeting most likely non-anagenic regions uh, or that non-anagenic supersite region. So we turned to Cryorium uh, to begin to investigate these six antibodies shown here, who all show, when you expand them to a larger panel, broad neutralizing activity. So what I'm showing you here is this their neutralizing activity or their mean IC50. Uh, so the lower the number, the better. And you can see that these antibodies were able to bind and neutralize wild type alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and Omicron variants of concern, as well as against authentic virus, right? So this suggested that antibodies against the NTD could actually uh, neutralize across many variants of concern. So where were they binding? So using cryorium, we looked at structures of some of these. And so what I'm showing you here is one such antibody called C1520. And so using local refinement and focused uh, refinement you know, algorithms, we were able to refine these structures down to about three angstroms uh, and show you know, binding of this antibody uh, you know, fat fragment to uh, NTD epitope that set outside this antigenic superstrike zone here in, in salmon color. Right? So when we look closer at this antigenic, you know, at this binding pose, it was very similar to other antibodies that have been discovered in that it targeted this NTD beta sandwich fold. Uh, but yet it had a very different angle of approach, right? So while all these antibodies were kind of binding that same face, you know, they all had, you know, different approaches towards this, you know, overall NTD epitope. So what made our antibody more potent uh, or able to cross-react with many different variants of concern, whereas these other antibodies were, you know, somewhat cross-reactive, but not as good as ours. So if we zoom in on the CRH3, we began to see that this you know, long loop uh, you know, encoded by the V gene of this antibody was able to insert into this hydrophobic pocket that is typically gated by this antigenic supersite loop as well as this N4 loop, right? And so this gate is typically closed. It's kind of illustrated here and here. Uh, and so our antibody is basically just opening this gate up 
and displacing in, or displacing any uh, hydrophobic ligand that is bound within this region. And so this hydrophobic pocket in the NTD is actually a site where heme metabolites typically bind. Uh, and so it display and those heme metabolites have been shown to actually uh, encode some resistance uh, to different antibody responses. Right, so we displace those heme metabolites and bind with high affinity into this hydrophobic pocket uh, mediated by hydrophobic residues at the tip of the CDRH3. And by doing so, we also, you know, our antibody doesn't engage really with these loops in the supersite or the N4 loop, which are spots where you see hot spots for viral mutation that could lead to uh, escape. You compare that to these other two antibodies uh, that also somewhat, you know, approximately engage that hydrophobic pocket. But they do so which engage by also engaging the energy supersite, making them uh, more susceptible to mutations within this region. Uh, same here, where you have uh, engagement with that hydrophobic pocket, but you also engage the N4 loop, uh, making it more susceptible to mutations in this region. Uh, this other antibody shown here also you know, opens the gate and inserts, but again, it binds and opposes such that it would engage also these energy supersites. So in essence, by displacing you know, these, these loops, uh, which are known hotspots for mutations, and burying into this hydrophobic pocket, our antibody was able to bind with high affinity and avoid mutations commonly uh, that arise within these antigenic supersite regions. Um, so that was important to show that we had this one antibody that was highly potent and utilized across many different variants of concern. We also looked at this antibody C1717, which was from a different, uh, different class of antibody. And this one was really nice to see. And so you have this antibody binding proximal to the viral membrane and situated such that it's very close to the fusion peptide machinery. And so within 10 angstroms of this fusion peptide machinery, suggesting that uh, it's most likely sterically hindering the ability of this fusion peptide to be processed further by the cellular proteases that are responsible for cleaving it in order to prime it for insertion into the viral membrane. But what I really liked about this structure was for the first time I was able to visualize an antibody binding pose that was very similar to what I saw originally in my negative saint EM reconstructions from convalescent uh, patients, uh, showing that you know, these antibodies that were binding you know, proximal to the viral membrane could indeed be a potently neutralizing antibody response that dominated a convalescent serum. Looking at the you know, specific interactions, uh, you know, this epitope was framed by two glycans at 282 and 603. Uh, but what's really interesting about these antibodies is that not only do they bind to the N-terminal domain, but they also bind other domains within uh, the spike trimer, including this SD2 domain encoded by residues between 580 and 614. And what's really interesting about this is we tend to see escape mutations arise around position 603. And so we always wanted to know, since we never visualized antibodies binding to this region, you know, what was the mechanism of this selective pressure? But now we see that you know, NTD antibodies binding in such a manner could you know, promote selective pressure against the, um, against the virus to escape uh, by moving around this glycan at 603 in order to thwart these types of antibody responses. Right? So this, again, was a clear illustration of antibodies that could promote selective pressure binding outside the antigenic supersite uh, and leading to uh, neutralizing activity. And so finally, we looked at one more from a different class, and this one is C1596. And this is really exciting for me because this is the first time uh, a student of mine uh, was able to you know, do some structural biology within my group. Uh, so Donis Rubio, he's a second year immunology student in my group. And he saw the structure of C1596 uh, down about three angstroms uh, using local refinement, again, to, uh, to get higher resolutions at the NTD uh, you know, antibody interface. And what I loved about this structure is that when we looked closely at it, uh, we see that not only is this antibody again binding to the NTD outside that antigenic supersite, uh, but it's actually forming a quaternary interaction between the RBD as well as the SD1 domain on the same polymer. Uh, and so this is really interesting because this bridging interaction uh, actually maintains the RBDs in this up conformation. Uh, you know, so these are antibodies that you know are actually priming RBD to potentially engage with ACE2, but yet these are highly potently neutralizing uh, antibodies. And we think the mechanism is such that you know it's forming this epitope or this quaternary interaction, and then there potentially uh, is FC mediated interactions that are hysterically hindering the ability of you know um, ACE2 to actually bind 
uh, to the spike trimers of these proteins. So we're taking this information uh, and utilizing that to actually develop future molecules. Uh, in that if we take the NTV structure, uh, this antibody shown here in purple, and couple it with the RBD-specific antibody, we begin to make bispecifics. And that's because this up RBD allows for a distance between you know, antibodies binding these two distinct epitopes uh, to be within a distance such that they could be attached to a single IgG-like molecule. So using the structural information, we're able to then design many different biospecific reagents uh, shown here, whether these be cross maps. So in this case, what we're doing here is adding an NTD binding arm as well as a RBD binding arm. And we're asking, can these bind uh, with avidity within the same uh, spike trimer? We're also doing other formats, which you know, allows for tetravalent types of interactions within the spike trimer, whether it be a FAB plus S single chain FB or kind of tandem single chain FB types formats. What we see so far is that when we do make these biospecifics, we do have some synergy between the NTD and RBD arms, suggesting that these types of molecules, which are resistant across many different variants of concern, are able to bind with intermolecular ability uh, and could be you know, next generation immunotherapies uh, that could fight off you know, emerging variants of concern in the near future. Um, so overall, we were able to show right, that the NTD is another site that we can begin to focus on uh, for potently neutralizing antibody responses uh, against, you know, this fall outside this antigenic super site and more or less are going to be um, less susceptible to emerging variants of concern. Uh, these antibodies are somewhat rare within the population, so we probably most likely won't see a lot of selective pressure that's able to escape these types of antibody responses, which again makes these a good immunotherapies moving forward. Um, so that was the NTV story, and I just want to quickly highlight, you know, a little bit of work we're doing, think about uh, emerging coronavirus threats. And so I spoke about uh, how, you know, in Pamela's lab, we were able to develop this mosaic eight vaccine that is now moving into the clinic uh, with the idea that if you take a mosaic nanoparticle and couple it with, or uh, this mosaic nanoparticle coupled with RBDs from distinct uh, strains, you're able to listen to their cross-reactive response. Well, that's great uh, because the main idea underlying this is that there's a conserved pocket or a conserved patch on the RBD shared within these strains. Uh, but yet, antibodies raised against these mosaic particles, while they'll be good against you know, antibodies in this class, uh, the SARBI covirus class or this group B of strains, they won't be able to protect against other strains, including those against MERS, as well as other beta coronaviruses and alpha coronaviruses that are emerging. So in work in collaboration with a group at, uh, in IRB in Switzerland, uh, we began to look for antibodies targeting what we term cold spots or regions within the spike trimer for which we saw very low frequency of mutations, including the SD1, the fusion peptide, and the stem helix. Uh, and so, you know, I won't talk about the SD1 antibodies, you know, too much other than to say we were able to identify antibodies against this region uh, using CRIRM to solve the structure. So they are bound and formed, again, a coordinary epitope between the SD1 as well as the RBD domain. These antibodies neutralized and were able to protect. Uh, but yet these were, again, were limited mostly to SARS-CoV-2 variants of concern and were morally cross-reactive, similar to what we saw against the N-terminal domain antibodies. Uh, but antibodies that we begin to look at against the fusion peptide and stem helix uh, were quite cross-reactive, and we were really happy to see this, which I'll show you in the next slide. Um, so we isolated many different antibodies. And just to go here, uh, and we show that these antibodies again can cross react against many different peptides from many different strains of coronaviruses. So if you look at the fusion peptide antibodies, you see the ability to cross react and bind against all beta coronaviruses, alpha coronaviruses, a delta coronavirus, as well as a gamma coronavirus, right? So this suggested that antibodies that were raised from uh, convalescent donors could indeed cross react. We also looked at antibodies against the helix and showed that they were you know, somewhat uh, limited to cross-reactivity within their own family, or not in this case, against the beta coronaviruses. But every once in a while, you did find antibodies that were able to cross-react even against alpha, as well as some gamma coronaviruses. So this was you know, really eye-opening to see that we can have antibodies that cross-react uh, that were identified from human donors. And more importantly, these antibodies, again, neutralized. So looking at the neutralization profile, we see in the case of some of the stem helix antibodies, uh, potencies on par with those found against the RBD targeting antibodies. 
So while not cryo-EM, we did solve a structure of these antibodies. Um, and this was done by Morgan Appenath in my group and showing that, you know, the antibodies bound uh, to this helical peptide and showed that it was really focused on these three residues. Uh, the, these three residues are typically occluded within the spike trimer. Um, so we're trying to actually trap now the spike protein in a, in a confirmation such that we can actually see binding of these, prote uh, of these antibodies to the native epitope on the spike trimer. And the reason we think this is possible is because this residue here at position 815 is a site of um, tempers 2 cleavage. And so therefore this, you know, this residue must flip out and rotate at some point in order to, for the protease to actually cleave at this position. Right, so we're using different ways to you know, track this, uh, including thinking about using time resolve techniques, uh, because we know if we bind this to ACE2, we get an instant triggering this allosteric throughout the spike trimer that could allow for better binding of these antibodies. Um, but generally speaking, these antibodies have been identified by other groups as well. And again, they all bind these three residues, which as you see here are highly conserved across uh, the coronavirus family. Again, explain their, um, explain their high cross-reactivity and their potency. And so we've also looked at the stem helix antibodies, showing that these antibodies all kind of also fall into similar classes, all binding this peptide um, and suggesting, again, this is a, another site of neutralizing the activity because when we take these antibodies and treat them or put them into animals, we can show that they prevent infection if given 24 hours post a challenge. We can see that, you know, compared to isotype, the animals don't get sick. Or if we give the antibodies after you know, viral infection, we can show that the animals, again, are treated uh, by these antibodies, suggesting that these antibodies are also effective uh, inside animals and animal models. So collectively, you know, we think that these two sites, at the fusion peptide and the stem helix, are important sites for future immunotherapies, as well as for a vaccine um, presentation. So we're working to develop now immunogens that will allow us to elicit these types of antibody responses. Uh, and some of this work is in collaboration uh, through an HHMI funded project with Carolyn Pertozzi, Tyra Wayne, and Peter Kim here at, at Stanford, uh, thinking about how we can begin to make immunotherapies against emergent uh, viruses, uh, including not only coronaviruses, but also influenza, as well as other respiratory viruses. Um, but going from here, where else can we do? We can begin to think about focusing on the receptors themselves in, the, in, human, uh, in humans, uh, which is illustrated by work shown here in collaboration with Paul B. Nash's group at Rockefeller University. Uh, and so this is, you know, I like showing the structure, uh, you know, to others outside of the field, but within the field, it's also great to see how far cryo-EM has really come. And that this is a structure of ACE2, which is about 70 kiloton bound protein bound uh, to a fat fragment. Uh, and we got this down to about 3.2 angstroms, uh, illustrating how these antibodies that can be raised against ACE2, when if you immunize mice against with using this protein, uh, we can have antibodies that bind overlap with the region that is usually recognized by the RBD uh, and allow you know, protection when delivered uh, back into in vivo models, right? So thinking about targeting receptors themselves you know, could potentially be a way forward to further you know, prevent viral infection or treat people uh, when you have constant antigenic drift within the virus, but yet we won't have antigenic drift within our own ACE2 proteins. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll, I'll end and say you know, it's been a pleasure um, you know, to start my group here at Stanford. Uh, show, you know, this is, you know, a lunch that we recently had, um, but members of my group, Morgan Abernathy, Teresa Chan, and Don Rubio are the work I showed you today. Uh, definitely want to thank uh, Pamela Bjorkman's lab and, you know, during my postdoc where I trained and learned prior EM. Uh, special thanks to Anthony West, Claudia Jetty, and Beth, uh, who helped with me in the projects I showed you against the RBD. Our collaborators at Rockefeller, Michelle Lusenswax Lab, and Paul B. Nash's group, and really uh, thanking Vinci and Franca for their ability to isolate many of these antibodies that I talked about today. Uh, Davide Wobianis group at the IRB in Switzerland, who you know, is, uh, we're collaborating with on the fusion peptide and stem helix story, uh, and the Stanford collaborators, Mark Davis and Osu Hong, as well as the uh, HHMI Epi team, uh, and our funders at HHMI, the Gates Foundation, and Biohub. Uh, so with that, I'm happy to take questions, and you know, this is a gift that just showed up on campus uh, back in December. They were excited to get finally installed, 
uh, in the ChemH building uh, to allow us to, again, to continue to use cryogenic to advance human health uh, against many different viruses as well as many different other uh, pathogens out there. So thank you. Okay. Thanks very much, uh, Christopher, to give us an update. What have you been uh, progressing so productively uh, in the last couple of years? And uh, let's see, the floor is open for questions. Uh, let me see. Let me click this. Okay. Um, the questions uh, raised from my audience, uh, Stephen, is given the conformational changes in the coronavirus spikes, particularly the RBD domain, do any of the neutralizing antibody identified in your study induce conformational change of spike to enable their binding? Yeah, man, that's a that's a great question. So, so what we've seen so far are there, you know, basically we were able to trap different conformations per se. So, like, for instance, that NTD antibody I showed from my student, right? It was actually whether it's inducing or trapping uh, the RBD in a up conformation. That's what we see, and we see this because it's bridging uh, glycan in the in terminal domain is stabilized by binding to this antibody. It's actually promoting, it's a, it acts kind of as a linchpin for RBD release, right? So it could be that either we're trapping this confirmation or inducing this confirmation by binding this antibody to the NTD, uh, and that is activating that linchpin, which then flips the RBD up. Uh, so we see this, you know, routinely where we'll see different confirmations that are locked or, or you know, different than what you would see in the non valve structure. Um, and so we do think, you know, there are certain classes of antibodies that can induce, you know, this, the spike trimer to disassemble, right? So like in the case of the SD1 domain, if you looked at the cryo map, um, let's quickly go back. Um, so this cryogenic structure was actually of a protomer because the SD1 epitope is such that it forces the NTD to move out the way. And when doing so, then it forces, it kind of destabilizes the S1 domain and produces this disassembled trimer, right? And so we have shedded S1 protomers that were actually the structure we, we determined, right? So there are antibodies that, you know, you know, can only access the epitope by basically destabilizing the S1 domain, inducing a kind of a shedding conformation, which is a known kind of uh, neutralizing mechanism. Uh, but those mechanisms are kind of hard to mimic, uh, you know, in the vaccine type of regimen. But yeah, these types of things do occur. Okay, in your cryo-EM studies, the one important element is to show where the antibody actually bind. Mm -hmm. uh, but do you also have any estimate the uh the binding frequency in other words if you have 100 um spite uh and then when you react with the antibody does each of these 100 spikes bind equally lightly or there's some bind and some don't bind what, what is the binding affinity of this antibody to the uh spite yeah, no, that's a great question. And we were actually quite surprised that many of the antibodies that were raised and identified early during you know, convalescence actually really had high affinity. So we're talking low nanomolar affinities for most of these antibodies. Uh, and in fact, we've identified a few antibodies that had picomolar affinities uh, towards their monomeric um, you know, domains or their monomeric epitopes. Uh, so if you couple these monomeric affinities of the FAB binding um, and think about an IgG format where you're going to have avidity and have even higher apparent affinities. Uh, these antibodies are quite, you know, high affinity um, targeting. So, so we do expect that, you know, when delivered at a certain concentration, that many of the spike trimers will be coded and bound by these antibodies. Mm -hmm. So in doing these kinds of work, what resolution is the bare minimum? Uh, to be informative for vaccine development? Uh, so it depends on, you know, what your target is. Um, I mean, I, I would say that, you know, in the case of like the mosaic vaccine, you know, there was no resolution really necessary, right? You can just think about taking different strains and coupling them to a particle and delivering that. 
Uh, for the more tailored approaches where you're trying to elicit specific antibody responses uh, and you want to promote certain um, you know, mutations within the antibodies to, to get that potency, uh, you know, and, and a fit higher affinity, act, you know, the higher affinities, then yeah, then you need probably at least, you know, three, you know, at least a three or three and a half angstrom resolution to begin to understand potential hydrogen bonding networks uh, that are involved and how, you know, uh, different residues are going to engage with that, um, you know, with their epitope. So, uh, so in the case of, say, the fusion peptide and the stem helix antibodies, where we need to design now specific scaffolds or protein-based immunogens, the higher the affinity there is really important uh, to allow us to actually develop these immunogens. Okay. Thank you. And there's another question from an audience, Michael. Uh, he asked about the mechanisms of the antibody. The question is, the, the antibody bind to the hydrophobic, hydrophobic pocket? of the NTD uh, to cause the neutralization. And his question is, does the rest of the antibody sticking out the pocket also make contributions to prevent uh, or interfere the infections process of the virus to the cell? Yeah, no, that's, that's a great question. Um, so we speculated that the neutralizing mechanism for these antibodies is, you know, kind of what you suggested, which is sterically interfering uh, with binding. So this is a known mechanism for many of the supercyte antigenic antibodies, but also seen for antibodies targeting these other phases. Um, and so, yeah, we do think steric hindrance by the full antibody. Uh, you know, you have, of course, the rest of the FAB that's not shown here in this illustration, as well as the FC domain, they all potentially interfere with ACE2 binding or interfere with the ability of the spike trimer to engage uh, the, the host membrane. So steric hindrance is one, uh, and we see this somewhat in when we look at uh, cell fusion assays, these antibodies when bound don't you know, lead, you don't have cell-cell fusion. All right, so these are probably the two main mechanisms that these antibodies utilize, and it's not necessarily binding that pocket itself, although that pocket has been known to be a you know, a place of resistance uh, by antibody responses by filling with these hydrophobic ligands. And also the NTD is involved in kind of walking along the host cell surface uh, by engaging other carbohydrates and lectins on the cell surface to help position the spike trimer uh, towards, uh, to bind to the ACE2 receptor. So, you know, altogether these NTD antibodies are potentially blocking cell cell fusion by blocking certain interactions between the spike and the host cell. So in a sense, uh, your research, the, a, one of the byproducts is to develop therapeutics. If you can bind something to the pocket, uh, which may be effective as a, a therapeutic reagent. Is that, do I extrapolate correctly? Right, well, we're just, by targeting this pocket, you know, these antibodies are recognizing a conserve Patch, right? And so one thing about, if you think about antibodies that are going to be cross-reactive, cross-variant to concern, you know, typically you want to target regions that are more conserved than something that's going to be highly variable, as in the case of the antigenic supercyte, right? And so this conserved patch, which is the, you know, the site of this hydrophobic pocket that, you know, again, engages heme metabolites, I think by just mimicking the engagement of these metabolites, right, by making this long CRH3, which fills into that, right, this is molecular mimicry of a function that the NTD typically carries out, right? So that type of interaction, you know, is a suitable interaction to allow high affinity binding and, again, lead to, you know, cross-reactivity across the variance of concern. Whether or not, you know, that pocket can be targeted by small molecules and act as a inhibitor, uh, I think some groups did look at this, but I don't know if, I don't know the outcome of, the, of that data, of that research, um, whether or not you can just target this hydrophobic pocket and act as an inhibitor. Good, all right. I think I don't see any more pressing questions. Uh, if, let's thank Christopher again for this uh, very stimulating and, and uh, exciting talk that he has done. Uh, so let's, turn back to Bob uh, to introduce our next speaker, Bob. Thank you, Juan. Thank you, Christopher. Terrific uh, start to your your stay uh, here in Stanford. And we wish you well and we'll follow what you're doing closely. 
Thank uh, you. <laughs> gives me a very great pleasure to introduce our, our next speaker, uh, Dr. Peter Dennis, uh, who uh, I think uh, from the physical science point of view uh, is uh, known for his uh, developments, uh, not so much of the electron microscope, but for the detection of uh, electrons themselves, which is a con of course contributed so very much uh, to the uh, cryo EM revolution and the improvement in in uh, re resolution of uh, of the biological imaging with the low electron doses. So uh, Peter has. Uh, uh, most folks will know, has been working at, at the Lawrence Berkeley Lab, uh, University of California, Berkeley, for several years now. Was originally from New Mexico, uh, spent time in Princeton Physics uh, Department and at CERN in Europe. And uh, now uh, he's uh, extending his work on electron detection uh, to uh, even... Uh, the next stage, perhaps, of interesting things uh, about superconducting microscopy, which we may or may not have time to go into today. But anyway, it gives me great pleasure uh, then to introduce uh, Peter Dennis, who I'm sure will address questions in both the biological and physical sciences field. Peter, over to you, please. Thank you very much, Bob. Uh, and uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, so I always like to start by pointing out that the well-named but poorly pronounced Bishop Barclay in 1710 asked if a tree falls in the forest and no one hears it, does it make a sound? So even 300 years ago, people were asking for high quantum efficiency detection. The problem in general is summarized here. There's an electron source, uh, there's an electron detector, and of course there's the electron detector developer. So what I'd like to do today uh, is to talk a little bit about sort of the basics of electron detection, what are the current methods and techniques, uh, but also to give some uh, context and perspective of how technology developments over time have improved our ability to see electrons. And then I will uh, say a little bit about what I'm working on at the moment. There, there's a long history to this field. There's a long history to electron microscopy. And so there are many people and many ideas uh, so I can't give a whole story. So this is just part of the story and it has a sort of parochial viewpoint. So uh, apologies in advance. So an electron traverses some detection medium. It deposits energy mostly by ionization. So there's some DE deposited for some DX of the path length that it travels. And within this uh, detection medium, uh, we add all that up to get the total amount of energy deposited. That energy is then turned into something useful, which are secondary quanta that we can observe. And the number of those quanta are the deposited energy divided by how much energy it takes to generate one of these secondary quanta. And that's a function of the material. Uh, another function of the material or what kind of quanta are generated. Uh, so in a scintillator, for example, it can take tens or hundreds of EV to generate uh, a photon. In a semiconductor, it takes a handful of EV uh, to generate electron, uh, uh, an electron hole pair. Signal to noise uh, is going to go like one over the square root of this number. And this number has fluctuations, uh, which are driven by something called the Fano factor, uh, which has to do with different ways that energy can be lost. And so that gives the ultimate limit for spectroscopic resolution, how, how good a spectroscopic energy detector can be made. In what's called an indirect detector, the incident electron generates some number of secondary quanta, and those create some number of tertiary quanta, which are then detected. Because this has multiple processes, uh, there are efficiency losses along the way, uh, and there's can be possible degradation of spatial resolution. Nonetheless, this is kind of a established technique. Uh, so we see here an example, still in use today. Electrons hit a phosphor screen. They generate visible scintillation photons. And then this retina model 1.0 visible light detector uh, is used to observe them. Uh, and the 
model 1.0 is pretty good, has 125 megapixels, big dynamic range, has direct connection to a CPU. Uh, time resolution is not good. Dynamic range is not as good as advertised. The processor is terrible, not even capable of artificial intelligence, even if it can do no morphic computing. So there's then an interest to try to electronically record uh, the electrons as they're detected uh, in order to get them into a computer so we can do something with them. Uh, and here's an early, very nice example associated with uh, the iconic uh, Tonomura experiment where uh, this article reports the actual buildup process of the interference pattern of the series of incoming single electrons in the form of a movie. So this from way back when has a lot of the features that one wants in an electron detector, but there are some complexities. Technology development in the meantime uh, was underway uh, for ways to record images. And the main uh, devices that are used, the charge coupled device, the active pixel sensor, uh, and no longer use the passive pixel sensor, were developed over a period that spans all the way from 1968 to 1969. Uh, the later one, the charge coupled device, uh, won a Nobel Prize in physics a few years ago. Uh, it has the miracle of noiseless charge transfer, and it formed the basis of digital photography in the beginning. Um, the other methods, which were not very good when uh, technology was young, uh, have since gotten much better and have overtaken uh, the CCD. But that led to the possibility of now having uh, an electronically recordable image using these uh, image sensor devices. Uh, and that's the fiber coupled phosphor. An electron hits a phosphor, that creates visible photons. Those are transported to an image sensor, for example, a CCD with a one to one fiber taper. So you see that here, you can read the text through the taper and the phosphor. The, the fiber, the thick fiber, protects the sensor from radiation damage from the electrons. The response is tunable from the phosphor thickness. Detection efficiency isn't perfect. Spatial resolution gets degraded, but there are a lot of advantages and these are still in use. Meanwhile, in particle physics, where people want to capture the trajectory of particles, uh, there was also the concern of how do I electronically record what's going on? Uh, here's a rather old example uh, taken with film of a bubble chamber picture of a photon creating an electron and a positron. Uh, so this is a bit arduous. Uh, and so there uh, was quite a bit of interest uh, in the particle community in direct detection in silicon. So as, as before here, the incident electron creates electron hole pairs, and those are then detected in this diode-like structure uh, that's shown here. It takes 3.6 eV to uh, generate an electron hole pair, and at the, you get at least 100 electron hole pairs per micron of uh, distance that the electron traverses. So going back to the 1980s and 1990s, the particle community didn't use image sensors, but used the microelectronics technology of image sensors to make uh, detectors that were essentially one dimensional, but could be combined uh, in two dimensions as shown in the middle. Uh, an early example of that uh, from 1984 is here. The sensor is in the middle and the rest is just bringing signals out to more electronics and racks of electronics that can process that. This was greatly advanced uh, by starting to make custom integrated circuits uh, where the racks of electronics that are needed get reduced to the size of a chip. Uh, and uh, this, this brought this technology uh, into uh, kind of wide use in the particle world. Then a little bit later on, in order to be able to handle higher occupancies, uh, instead of having two one-dimensional sensors uh, to uh, determine where position was, uh, people started to make these hybridized pixels where they're 
uh, is a sensor that is now patterned into dimensions in pixels. And that pattern sensor uh, is attached with tiny solder bumps onto a custom integrated circuit uh, with a matching integrated circuit part behind every pixel. This has the advantage that one can pack a lot of intelligence into a single pixel. Uh, it needs relatively large pixels uh, because of the interconnection techniques uh, and the corresponding electronics behind it. And these sensors uh, tend to be relatively thick uh, in terms of dimension. Uh, uh, a huge amount of investment uh, went into making versions of these detectors as sort of 100 million pixel sensors for the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, and you see here uh, two examples of these. Uh, these sensors had X-ray spin-offs, uh, and that uh, did a lot uh, for the world of crystallography um, in order to help increase uh, the uh, utility of uh, synchrotron light sources for doing crystallography. Naturally, people tried these out for TEM. And so here's uh, an example from 1997 uh, with a, uh, a small detector with some number of pixels. And uh, not surprisingly, as the energy of the incident electron increases, the size of the charge blob, uh, how many of these pixels fire, uh, gets larger and larger. And this is because at energies used for electron microscopies, electrons tend to scatter a lot. So this just shows the, the trajectories of a number of electrons at 300 keV or 100 keV entering here into a 300 micron thick piece of silicon. Uh, and uh, on average, uh, these electrons will penetrate some depth, some penetration depth, so that they form kind of a sphere uh, on average of uh, charge deposition. At TEM energies, the range, just how far the electron will go uh, in microns is roughly proportional to the electron energy in keV. Uh, and that penetration depth is something like about half the range. So at 300 keV, uh, uh, a three or 400 micron thick piece of silicon uh, will get kind of filled up with charge from these electrons. But at lower energies, uh, that's a lot less. Uh, so uh, the trade-off between, let's say, pixel size and energy becomes very energy dependent. Uh, another feature is that the energy deposition, DDX, uh, starts to increase quite a bit as the energy gets lower. Uh, and that DDX goes like something like one over the energy. Starting in the early uh, 1990s, around the turn of the millennium, there was interest in using uh, these types of uh, MOS image sensors in particle physics uh, for a proposed electron-positron collider because uh, they were thinner, so there'd be less multiple scattering. And because the pixels could be smaller, the spatial resolution could be higher. At that time, the technology had advanced enough that this made sense. Uh, and so this plot just shows how pretty much thanks to cell phones, the, uh, the CMOS image sensors overtook CCDs as the uh, sensor of choice for photography. This is useful in electron microscopy as a way of overcoming multiple scattering. So what, what's shown here is a cross section of a CMOS integrated circuit uh, of the kind of sensor that you found uh, in your very old iPhone. So if you are, uh, happen to have something like an iPhone one um, and, and that integrated uh, circuit is a thick layer of uh, kind of inert silicon that is just used as a mechanical support, a thinner layer that uh, has higher resistivity, and then the back-end wiring, which is just wires and glass. So if we look at an electron that traverses uh, through all of this, it scatters a bit as it goes through uh, this first few microns of uh, metal and glass. It then 
scatters a bit more as it goes through the active silicon, uh, and then it keeps scattering uh, as it goes through this uh, highly doped uh, inert silicon. Why that's useful is because one collects the charge that's generated here, but the charge that's generated uh, in this highly doped uh, silicon immediately recombines, so you don't see it. So all you see uh, is the charge that's collected here. Uh, so this helps to overcome all of this multiple scattering here. And then just to do a slightly better job of that, one then uh, takes this piece of silicon and mechanically thins it uh, as much as you can uh, to make it something that you can handle and thus eliminate the backscatter uh, that would come from a thick piece of silicon. So in, at least for me, the opportunity to turn that into something usable at scale on an electron microscope came through the DOE team project, which ran from 2003 to 2009. Uh, one of the goals there being to take, to rethink the electron detector and to take care of the improvements that this technology now allows. And a big challenge was that in the case of material science, the fluence can be large. You can have a lot of, uh, you can have a lot of electrons. And to, to deal with that, that motivated speed, partly as a way to get dynamic range, uh, because if you can go fast enough, that's fewer electrons per frame you have to capture, but also the interest of dynamics so that one could uh, make movies and you know, observe things in situ. And just a couple early examples of what was possible uh, with this first megapixel 400 frame per second detector uh, with speed and sensitivity was being able to look at dynamics uh, of plane boundaries and to look at the structures of nanocrystals in solution in 3D um, and make 3D reconstructions, again, by taking advantage of speed and sensitivity. Uh, thanks to uh, a, a nicely organized workshop that took place now 15 years ago, uh, that led to a collaboration together with UCSF and Catan that uh, still exists today. Um, and uh, that looked at, to get uh, uh, the, um, uh, to take something like the team sensor and make that something useful for biology. So the first uh, iteration of that was the K2 sensor um, that was still 400 frames per second, but now 16 times as many pixels. Uh, and then the K3, which was faster with 24 uh, times as many pixels. So over this period, uh, there was sort of a factor of 24 increase in area uh, and 100 times the readout speed. And then it turned out that this speed uh, was actually useful for biology since it uh, was a way to correct for beam-induced motion. So this turned out to be useful. In, in thinking about, well, what, what can we do? What can we improve? What are the limitations? The position accuracy is limited by multiple scattering. So, so here's an electron, it fits the sensor, uh, it makes its track, and this is just a projection of the energy that it's deposited along the track length. So the electron hit the sensor here, but since what I'm observing are these bits of energy that are deposited, the position I compute uh, as just the average energy deposition is here. So it looks like the electron, I compute the electron hit the sensor here, even though it entered here. And that position error uh, at say 300 keV is, is just roughly proportional to the thickness of the sensor. So that motivates a thin sensor uh, in order to minimize uh, this position error. In addition, the manner in which the charge is collected in the sensor uh, influences the point spread function, how big the uh, apparent uh, energy deposition is. In the case of a sensor that is fabricated on a very high resistivity uh, material, one can apply an electric field and the electron hole pairs that are generated will then drift in straight lines, roughly, uh, along the electric field. So uh, they form a very narrow charge cloud. Most sensors, however, uh, aren't 
such high resistivity. So there isn't an electric field and the charges that are produced diffuse into four pi. And that increases the, uh, the, the electron hole pair charge cloud uh, from the energy that's deposited. If the rate of incoming electrons is relatively high, then one has an integrating detector where you simply add up all the little bits of energy deposition. Uh, and the, these charge clouds from electrons will overlap each other and you'll get some image that looks like this. And this is pretty much the conventional kind of image sensor uh, that, that one is used to just integrating for a certain amount of time, how much charge uh, is deposited. If you go fast enough that uh, the probability of having more than one electron per pixel in a frame is small, then you can now look at these individual charge depositions. And instead of integrating this charge, you can localize that uh, to a point and in, in this way count electrons. So this is a counting detector versus an integrating detector. Uh, and this gives you the possibility of subpixel resolution. In an integrating detector, the point spread function is a convolution of the multiple scattering as well as this charge collection. So if we look at the, the multiple scattering, uh, that just goes like the sensor thickness uh, and the, uh, the charge collection uh, is relatively constant for a high resistivity sensor. In terms of a counting detector, uh, it's the limitation is only multiple scattering because you actually use this charge collection information to your advantage to get subpixel resolution. So this counting improves spatial resolution if the multiple scattering is less than the pixel size, so you can take advantage of it. The charge collection is on the order of the pixel size so that you can use that bit of spread charge uh, to take advantage of the information. And if the readout noise and its fluctuations are low enough to make this work. So there's tuning and optimization uh, to be done here. So noise is important in this. Uh, first, uh, just for detection. So here's uh, an energy de deposition probability distribution function. And here's a plot of the noise distribution from a one zillion channel detector. If you now look at this tail here, because there are a zillion channels, then if there's overlap at all between that, uh, that noise distribution and the electron energy uh, uh, distribution, then you have to make a choice of either having uh, high purity at the expense of some efficiency or high efficiency at the expense of some fake hits. Uh, so, and, and so that sets the basic detection efficiency. For subpixel resolution, uh, because we're using uh, this uh, charge collection, noise is also important because we want to be able to measure uh, these small amounts of charge that are collected in neighboring pixels. Uh, and so that amount of charge, the, the noise has to be low enough for us to be able to see it. Uh, so there's a trade-off between the pixel size, how far the charge spreads, and what the noise is in order to be able to use this technique. In, in a sensor that's thick, uh, all of the energy is deposited in the sensor and that energy loss will follow a Gaussian distribution. In a sensor that's thin, not all the energy is deposited in the sensor and the distribution follows this Landau distribution, which is Gaussian on the low side and has a high side tail because there are always ways to lose more energy uh, and the, the asymmetry of this distribution increases as the sensor gets thinner. In an integrating mode, uh, if you have a small number of electrons, two or three, this tail means that you have a very hard time 
telling the difference between one, two, or three electrons in an integrating mode. And, and that's a, a undesirable feature of a very thin sensor. As the number of electrons in an integrating mode gets bigger and bigger, then uh, you start to approach uh, the most probable value for the energy distribution and the error on the number of electrons becomes smaller. So as mentioned before, uh, uh, by having this sensor that's thin uh, and has a thin collection region, that helps to overcome multiple scattering. And at higher energies, like 300 kV, that works very well. At lower energies, 100 kV, 80 kV, and below, uh, this doesn't work so well because there's significant scattering and energy loss uh, in these few microns of glass and aluminum before you get to the sensitive region. Uh, and so that um, uh, hampers lower energy uh, detection quality. So we can do the same thing uh, as cell phones did uh, when they went from cameras in the back that were back illuminated to cameras in the front that in order to make them small ended up being front illuminated. And that is to turn this uh, piece of silicon upside down, remove all this inert silicon and have the electrons directly impact uh, the sensitive silicon volume. And so this just shows a comparison uh, at 300 kV and 100 kV uh, and because uh, one no longer passes through this inert material, um, that uh, improves lower energy performance, works best at low occupancy, uh, and these sorts of things are starting to become uh, commercially available. So in, in, in terms of CMOS-enabled detectors, the kind I've described, uh, all of these direct detectors effectively are a diode connected to some electronics. And the devilish detail is really how that connection is made. So to compare um, for something CMOS image sensor based versus something that's a hybrid pixel, uh, in one case, uh, the active thickness is thin, the pixels are small. In the other, uh, it's thick, the pixels are large. Uh, you get more signal in uh, the in a hybrid pixel, uh, but at the expense of more scatter. You get more pixels in a CMOS sensor, uh, but you get more intelligence in a hybrid pixel. In a CMOS sensor, you can't hold that much charge. Uh, you can do much better in a hybrid pixel, uh, but at the expense of the number of pixels. No single detector is optimal for every application. This prevents me from being unemployed. And the capability for specialized detectors is a good thing. So this is adding to you know, what, what microscopy can, can do. So just to quickly uh, say some words about some current activities, uh, there are three here I'll just go very quickly through. Um, the first is uh, a, a sensor made for uh, 4D scanning microscopy. But many sensors now record not just the amplitude, but also scattering pattern. Um, and this operates uh, at 87,000 frames per second, puts out a lot of data, uh, which we send to uh, our local supercomputer. Uh, so spitting out data 480 gigabits per second. Uh, an example that I like very much is using that for low dose imaging of clay. Uh, so I have a beam sensitive sample where it's possible to get a very far, large field of view at high resolution. Uh, so here, uh, half angstrom resolution with 500 electrons per square angstrom versus one angstrom uh, at 6,000 electrons per square angstrom with sort of conventional imaging. Next is trying to make an improved detector for spectroscopy, for electron energy loss spectroscopy. Uh, these CMOS counting detectors are well suited, uh, but uh, right now, because they can't handle a lot of signal, uh, beam, the beam gets blanked, uh, and so there are wasted electrons. So currently in fabrication is something that uh, hopefully will uh, improve that. Uh, that's very high speed uh, and has more radiation hardness. Uh, and it's also two detectors in one uh, and can be reconfigured to one of these 4D stem detectors act behind a spectrometer. Uh, so also good for things like micro LED. Lastly, 
uh, we're working on a, uh, something for cryo-electron tomography uh, in order to take out the beam-induced motion whenever uh, the, uh, uh, the beam is shuttered as the uh, sample is tilted. Um, it requires a, a large sensor at a tremendous speed. So right now we're doing kind of basic pixel R&D on improving signal to noise, uh, improving speed since the speed limit goes roughly like one over the psi squared. Um, and then there's a minor detail that this will put out uh, a pretty large amount of data. So in summary, and I won't read this, uh, there are many things that one acts of a detector, spatial resolution, efficiency, speed, intensity. Uh, and in many cases, we're pretty close to where we should be, but not always 100%. Again, no one detector does everything. Uh, but we're in a, a nice age where we have detector development going on, uh, and so it's possible to find solutions to specific questions. And of course, tons of people help make this happen, uh, as well as many facilities, uh, many collaborators, and uh, many funders. So I thank them, and I thank you, and uh, happy to answer any questions. Great. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Peter. I, uh, we uh, request uh, questions through the Q&A, but uh, I have um, some things which are raised immediately, of course. Um, you mentioned uh, at the end this uh, throwaway slide where you might have 20 uh, terabytes of uh, information. Uh, compared to one, uh, only one uh, for a 40 uh, STEM experiments. So uh, uh, how are we going to uh, process that and, and to, to uh, collect the information and, and to analyze it? Uh... So uh, I, 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 have, I have somewhat, uh, I have a contrarian view there, but I guess I'm glad to say contrarian things. Um, if I can, let me see if I can figure out how to get there, just a second. Uh... So, so uh, this shows kind of data rates just at the National Center for Electron Microscopy um, over the last long period of time. Uh, so a factor of 10 to the six in four decades. And so one, there's, there's some three axes you could look at here in terms of performance, simplicity, or cost. Uh, I, I tend to like to stay in the performance. Uh, and I think the, the, uh, the ways for addressing these uh, are uh, by sort of adding more programmable uh, intelligence near, but not directly on the detector. What, um, what I think the uh, networking technology has improved uh, at the same kind of Moore's law rate as everything else. So the problem isn't moving the data. The problem is where it lands and what you do with it. Uh, so in many cases, uh, you can process this locally uh, and, for example, count in FPGAs or do other processing. Uh, but it often turns out to be uh, useful to be able to transport that information. So in the case of this 4D detector, being able uh, to process those data sets uh, in quasi real time uh, at NERSC um, has turned out to be a useful feature. Uh, so. Uh, I think there are many ways to address this, depending on the need. Uh, if, if the interest is simplicity and cost, then I think one should do a lot of upfront processing. Uh, and if it's in getting the maximum performance, I think one should accept larger uh, data volumes and be ready to move them uh, uh, to compute. If that, if that I, I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Well, <laughs> right, I will ponder that. but. Going back to your original title, Count Every Electron, um, how close are we to counting every electron and knowing uh, where it came from and what its energy is? And I think you also added um, what time it was generated. Uh, yeah. So, how close uh, are we to that? Or maybe we're already there. So, I, I would like, like everything, that depends. Um, so everything is very electron energy dependent. Uh, so if uh, so, if, as an example, uh, 
people may know of uh, the idea that Ken Downing had many years ago of a decelerator. Uh, and to take the electron after uh, we've gotten the optical information out of it and change its energy to optimize it for detection. So depending on what the electron energy is, we're closer or less close in, in terms of being able to have uh, high efficiency uh, and high spatial resolution. As the energy goes up, the multiple scattering becomes less significant. Uh, at some point when the energy goes way down, uh, the multiple scattering also becomes less important. Intermediate energies like 60 to 80 kV uh, are real challenges for detection. Um, so I would say that we are pretty good for most TEM energies. Uh, I think these technological improvements that help at lower energies help us to get to uh, higher efficiency and higher spatial resolution. Although I think there's, you know, there's still more work to be done then. In terms of uh, spectroscopic detection, so if you want to de detect the electron energy uh, in the electron detector, rather than by using an optical spectrometer, then that's a materials limitation uh, the, uh, by the Spano factor and how much energy it takes uh, to create an electron hole pair. So people have looked at superconducting uh, sensors where it takes milli electron volts rather than uh, several electron volts to create quanta to be counted. That dramatically improves the spectroscopic resolution, but uh, they're a little bit harder to implement. Time resolution, there are hybrid pixels that timestamp. Uh, so that's pretty good. Uh, in terms of getting movies to the kinds of frame rates one would really want for the ultimate in situ uh, case, of course, we're not there, uh, but then uh, maybe the electron source is not quite there either. So I would say there have been improvements, but there definitely is still more room for improvement. So um, do you think then that this will put the uh, X-ray detector people out of business if you uh, can determine, say, compositions through energy loss spectroscopy at a, for every electron, which uh, is every electron is not going to create an X-ray. Uh, every electron is an electron. So how, how would that uh, influence uh, X-ray detector uh, technology? Competition is good. Um, so, uh, you know, electrons are going to do what electrons are going to do. So they're, you know, they're, they're, they're going to scatter, they're going to make X-rays. Um, and uh, then the question will be, uh, how, much, how, how much effort does one want to go uh, into in improving uh, the, that X-ray detection? But uh, I think there are definitely outlets for improving uh, e uh, eels. Um, as a technique to get uh, better spectroscopy. Um, and I would say not only at room temperature, but maybe other temperatures. And I was sort of hoping that there might be a question from Nestor about this, but uh, I don't see one. <laughs> um, let's see, uh, there's a question. Are we ever going to approach DQE of one at Nyquist? So, uh, that, um, the, in, in the ways that one redefines Nyquist, let's say. So subpixel resolution uh, has improved uh, detection efficiency at Nyquist. Uh, and, and so in some sense, uh, once, once you start counting the, you know, the conventional sense of a Nyquist limited uh, detector um, uh, needs to get modified. So the, so the question there, uh, will be, you know, what are the acceptable trade-offs in order to get there? The, the challenge from a detection point of view is that electron optics limits the size the detector can be. Uh, and so now you have to trade off between the number of pixels that go in there and the corresponding properties. Uh, so the way to improve the detection limit at Nyquist um, is, is to improve what's possible in terms of subpixel resolution. Why do you have any uh, comments for or questions for for Peter? Uh, yeah, Peter, it's a very nice uh, talk. Uh, the questions about the size, uh, the number of pixels per detectors. 
what's the chance of getting a larger number of pixels? Because for biologists, we are interested in getting a lot of real estate on the specimen at the same time at the highest possible resolutions. So for example, this uh, CCI uh, funded uh, tomography detector is gonna have a hundred million pixels. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. And the, so the, the, the limitations are that um, what, what's the size of a sensor that uh, you can use the electrons in? So what are the electron optical limitations to how big you can make a sensor? And then what with the trade-off between uh, um, performance and pixel size, what pixel size makes sense? Uh, so uh, Eric Fossum, who was the reinventor of the active pixel sensor, had this wonderful quote about the triumph of marketing over physics. When some camera comes out that has more pixels because the pixels are smaller, uh, you run out and buy it because it must be better. But the optics aren't any better. So the camera is not really any better. So there's a, there's a sort of optimized pixel size given by multiple scattering and charge collection. And then it's how many of those can you fit into the N centimeter region where the electron optics are usable. And that kind of fixes the number of pixels that, that you can have. Certainly the, um, the CMOS technology wouldn't limit the size for this where, where the electron goes and where it's detected. Well, so it, 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 that's, that's exactly the idea of more pixels aren't necessarily better pixels. So the CMOS, uh, you can definitely make things smaller feature size, but the multiple scattering and the charge collection uh, within the piece of silicon doesn't know what the feature size is. So uh, uh, you, you don't necessarily gain. Then there are various technical reasons why at some point uh, going to smaller feature size is, is not as good. Uh, two of them are that uh, in, in order to make Moore's law work, lithographic features shrink, but uh, Moore's law works fine if the size of implants don't shrink as fast. So the pixel size starts not to scale with the technology node uh, once you start to make things small. That's the first problem. Second problem is that, uh, again, because we follow uh, the things needed to keep Moore's law working, as the gate oxide thickness gets reduced, the full scale that a pixel can hold also gets reduced. So at some point you run out of headroom. Um, so it's not, you, you don't actually gain technologically just by pushing to the smallest possible feature size. Uh, I have another, another question. Uh, Richard Henderson suggests 100 kilovolt electrons would be ideal for a lot of biological samples. So what would you recommend one get in terms of detector for 100 kilovolt electrons? So this is where uh, I, I think it's kind of mentioned uh, way back. Oops. Uh-oh. That wasn't what I had in mind. Um, let's see again. Uh, sorry. So, uh, so this is where I think backside illumination at something like 100 kV uh, uh, is very helpful so that you don't suffer the scattering um, from the material on top and uh, you uh, directly get the electrons into uh, some piece of silicon. That silicon can be thick or thin. Uh, and now it depends on what you want to do with these. If you don't need many pixels, then at 100 kV or below for a smaller number of pixels, a hybrid sensor, uh, that doesn't have anything on top of it can work pretty well. If you want more pixels, then you want uh, a back illuminated CMOS uh, image sensor. So um, you, you have been talking all, all along about uh, silicon detectors. And so these detectors are becoming not inexpensive, should we say. So uh, what about other semiconductor device materials, uh, which... Um, uh, but wouldn't they uh, also uh, be considered uh, as alternatives and uh, perhaps improve resolution and, and speed and so on? 
So the, I, I would say the challenges that are the following. The, the silicon itself is cheap. Um, so you know, the, the silicon sensor is not what's expe expensive. It's everything else that is. And those costs are not going to go down once the semiconductor becomes a little bit more exotic. Not to mention, um, I think we all know how many different semiconductors were going to overtake silicon. Uh, like we, we all have phones made out of gallium arsenide and, and, and. Uh, so it's, uh, in terms of getting uh, the density uh, and the reliability, uh, it's pretty hard to beat silicon. In, in things like the X-ray world and other worlds, uh, people do look for higher Z sensors to go to higher energy. Uh, but I think it's, I, I think it, you know, it's just hard to beat silicon. Um, it, right, it's hard to beat silicon, but the, there are, uh, I would have thought, advantages uh, from a circuit point of view from going to uh, more exotic semiconductors or certainly so it, it, combinations it, it, thereof. I, I would say you know, if if you could if you could have the kind of things that the semiconductor that the you know the electronics industry could do with silicon if you could do that with other semiconductors absolutely um, but uh, you you just can't so as as all of us who have artisanal uh, fabrication facilities know uh, we're not going to compete with the major fabs and put them out of business uh, with you know what we can do in our lab just because there's been such a huge investment in perfecting uh, the commercial semiconductor industry. Um, so, I, so I think practically speaking, uh, the, the, the bang for the buck um, is not yet there. The, uh, I, I will say for things like, um, you, you know, if one can ever get to the point where superconducting sensors um, can, you know, can become practical uh, and scalable, that you know, those, those offer uh, some interesting advantages because of uh, how little energy it takes to make uh, one of the quanta you count. Right, but I, I was thinking more in terms, not in terms of fab line uh, approach to making the semiconductors, but um, more a one-off type of thing whereby you might make a few, uh, but uh, very well designed and very carefully made, maybe using electron beam lithography as well. <laughs> Why? Why not? Sure. Although the the uh, the cost of that particular detector would be uh, high compared to a silicon, then at least uh, it might uh, offer uh, the technological advances uh, advantages. Yeah, and and for something that is a kind of specialized one-off thing, especially where you don't need a whole lot of pixels, um, absolutely. Um, so for some kind of specialized scattering detector. Uh, or uh, EDS sensor or something like that, um, then uh, absolutely. But for a large number of pixels where density and integration and interconnect are key things, um, uh, that's, there's just been so much investment uh, in commercial fabs, it's, it's just hard to beat that. Good, since I teach my engineering 50 class, uh, introductory material science, uh, this quarter, then I always keep saying that it's very difficult to beat silicon, uh, just the same way as you wouldn't make uh, uh, a Golden Gate Bridge out or anything but steel. So uh, I'm glad to know that silicon and steel uh, still uh, are going to be valuable materials uh, for the future. So uh, thank <laughs> you. So uh, I can re recite all what you've been saying the last five minutes to my class then today. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, I think that um, uh, Wa has had to go to class uh, already, and uh, my class is coming up in a in a uh, in an hour or so. So I'd like to thank uh, both Christopher and Peter for a wonderfully stimulating session uh, to close out our academic year. So thank you both. Uh, thank you both very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, then we will. Uh, I like to thank Yi again, who's still here. Uh, even though he's meant to be going to class as well uh, for running uh, our program uh, this uh, calendar year so very well. Thank you, Yi. Thank you. And uh, we look forward to seeing everyone in the fall and at the various meetings uh, over the summer. So please, uh, uh, good health, uh, safe travels uh, to wherever you might be going or not going, 
and uh, uh, let's uh, look forward to new developments in electron microscopy, which might be around the corner in the uh, fall of uh, 2023. Thank you. Thank you both. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.